Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I am, I am Pastor Michael Jakes, and this is the Wednesday Night Cutting It Right Bible Study. Thank you for joining us on tonight. Uh, we pray that all is well with you. Uh, we pray that this Bible study will touch your heart. We pray that this Bible study will get into your soul. A Bible study is not a real Bible study until it not only makes you think, but it gets into your heart, into your soul, and changes the way you live. And that's what we aim to do in these particular studies. Uh, we are streaming live right now on Spreaker.com. That's spelled S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. We are also streaming live on YouTube and also on Facebook Live, of course. And if you are watching on Facebook Live, want to just share this page with someone so that someone else also may have an opportunity to be blessed by the Word of God tonight. Uh, we thank you for doing that. Also, you can go over to our uh, YouTube channel. When we are done here. You can subscribe. You can also... Go to our website at that's the word.org. That's the word.org, and you can find all of our podcasts there. Also on Spreaker.com, you can also find uh, all of our podcasts. We have eight uh, podcasts that we do produce, and the, you will find them all there at Spreaker.com. Amen. So we thank the Lord for what He is doing. We thank the Lord for, once again, giving us this opportunity to be able to share the Word of God. Anytime that we have an opportunity to share the Word of God, it is always a good time. We have been studying these days, uh, we are in a study of the Holy Spirit. We've entitled our particular study, The Real Holy Spirit. The Real Holy Spirit, because there, there seems to be, for some time now, a, a, a difference of opinion, and I, I use that word opinion uh, very broadly, uh, a difference in interpretation as to who the Holy Spirit is. Uh, some people have the notion that the Holy Spirit is a thing, uh, some individuals have the notion that the Holy Spirit is a force, uh, not understanding that the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, he is a person uh, who has a personality and characteristics, and we have been studying those in the past few weeks. And on tonight, tonight we're not going to depart from we're not going to depart from our series on the Holy Spirit, but we want to we want to we want to go in a little bit deeper tonight. We want to go in a little bit deeper. Because on the last few programs, we've been talking about the fact that you can resist the Holy Spirit. Uh, we talked about last week the fact that you can you can quench the Holy Spirit, that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. And we stopped off right there, the fact that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can actually sadden the Holy Spirit by your behavior and, and, and my behavior. The things that we do, the Holy Spirit is affected by the actions of individuals. And so we must be careful what we do in his presence so as not to to disturb the moving and operation of the Spirit of God. Because he wants to move. He wants to operate. He wants to touch. He wants to go in. He wants to, he wants to touch the hearts of individuals. But, once again, if the atmosphere, if the atmosphere is not conducive to this, then we can by our sinful activities, by our sinful behavior, we can literally push the Holy Spirit out. And He will not move. So we do not want to be guilty of doing any of these things. We don't want to resist Him. We don't want to quench Him. We don't want to put out the Spirit's fire. And we do not want to grieve Him. Now, on tonight, we want to talk about one thing that we can do. One thing that we can do is, is one, of the, one of the things that you might say... I've never done such a thing. I'm a Christian and I've never done such a thing. I would never think of doing such a thing. But unfortunately, this particular thing that we talk about tonight, we're going to talk about tonight, it happens. And it goes on. And it goes on continuously. It goes on in the lives of individuals and it goes on in the body of Christ, in church, in church services. It goes on. And we're talking about is the fact that we can insult, yes, we can insult the Holy Spirit. We do not want to be guilty of insulting the Holy Spirit. Now, you say, how can we insult the Holy Spirit? We'll talk about it as soon as we have this word of prayer. We'll get right into it. Amen. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for being with us one more time. And Lord, we pray that tonight that you will speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus, that you will show us what you want us to know tonight. Lord, Speak to those who are listening, who are watching right now. Lord, I pray they might hear something that might touch their heart and move them. Lord, I pray you might have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Once again, 
feel free if you have this is a Bible study. Uh, feel free if you have something that you would like to contribute. If you have a question or a comment, uh, please feel free uh, to let us. We'll, we'll do our best uh, to communicate back with you. So how can we insult the Holy Spirit? Oh, yes, we can insult the Spirit of God. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10 and starting in verse number 29. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 29. It says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. And hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Now that word done despite unto the spirit of grace, that is speaking about insulting the Holy Spirit. Yes, you can, I can insult the Holy Spirit. We insult the Holy Spirit several ways that we can do this. Several ways. Now, once again, let me let me just say that as we embark on this particular study, that you will probably hear things that maybe you have never heard before. Uh, you may hear things that may sound strange to you because, once again, it's new to your hearing. But we want to see what the Bible says. We want to understand what the Bible means. And so, let's begin. You insult the Holy Spirit. We insult the Holy Spirit when we when we opt out of grace in favor of law. We insult the Spirit of God when we opt out of grace and we step into law. Now read what it says here in Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 29. That he, suppose ye as he, as he be thought worthy who hath Trodden underfoot. Trodden means to trample, to step on. Trodden underfoot the Son of God. And hath counted the blood of the covenant where we, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. And so there's a such thing as moving away from the safety, uh, from, the, from what we have in the cross. And when we go to something else, we are moving away from the grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. So we were saved by grace. You were not saved because you kept a set of laws. Law does not save. Law cannot save. Law cannot keep you saved. It is by grace. And so if you turn your back on what saved you, you insult the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit who drew you in. It's the Holy Spirit. I, I fear that now, nowadays, I just I was just walking down the street just a few minutes ago and I came across a particular church who had a sign in the window, in the doorway, and it said, Miracle Tuesday. Miracle Tuesday. Now, what does this mean? Miracle Tuesday. I, we understand what that means. That if you show up on that particular night, you can expect God to do a miracle for you in your life because there'll be things, there'll be somebody there that will pray for you, that will anoint you. Uh, you have to come believing. I, we understand the mechanism behind a statement like that. Miracle Tuesday. But here's what I fear. I fear that... We are trying to attract people in by giving them almost, it's become, church has become a place to be entertained. Church is never the place to come to be entertained. And we have to sort of draw them in, tell them there's going to be a miracle, tell them there's going to be an explosion of, of God's power, tell them, tell them something fantastic or wonderful to get them to come in. This is how we draw the people in. Listen. If the gospel, the power of the gospel, which is the cross, according to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18, 
if the power of the cross is not enough to draw people in, then nothing will draw them in. You will get them in. But will you get them saved? Because if your message is just miracles, then it's not enough. The greatest miracle of all is the salvation of a soul. The greatest miracle of all. The greatest miracle of, the greatest miracle of all is not the, the raising of a dead person. The greatest miracle of all is not uh, the healing of a body from whatever disease it might be. As great as it is, as miraculous as it is, the greatest miracle is when a person goes from spiritual death to spiritual life. When the soul in an individual is awakened. That is a miracle. I was watching something online several years back. Actually, I watched, probably watched it on TV uh, several years back. And this woman was being witnessed to. And she was being told. I don't know if, she was, I don't know if this was the first time she had ever heard it. But it's the first time that, it, it, that it, she heard it and it sunk in. She was told that Jesus loved her. And that Jesus died for her. She was shown the fact that she was a sinner. She was shown the fact that if she died in her sins, that she would go to hell. And she was told all of these facts. Nobody, nobody was preaching to her. No one was preaching at her. In the classical sense of preaching, standing behind a pulpit and the preacher is proclaiming something. This was out on the street and it was conversational. And the woman heard these words that this man was telling her and she broke down right there on the street. The Holy Spirit arrested her right where she was and she got saved. She got saved right there. See, that's what the power of the Holy Spirit can do. You don't need to try and attract people and bring them in. We don't have to use all sorts of different means and maneuvers of the world to try to get people to come. You promise people nothing. You tell them that if you come, the Lord can touch your heart. He can save your soul. Yes, he can do a miracle in your life. He can do it. But when we begin to try to make promises and we try to create, uh, we try to create different, uh, different days and try to say that it's going to be a miracle Tuesday and, and miracle Thursday and all these things, we, 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 we stray away from the truth of what the Holy Spirit really wants to do. We have to stay at the cross. We have to stay at the cross. And so when we, when we opt out from the cross and go to law, works, we insult the Holy Spirit. It says here, you have, you have, you have done despite unto the spirit of grace, which is the Holy Spirit. Done despite. Here's what, another thing that happens, how we can insult the Spirit of God. You insult, we insult the Holy Spirit when we choose or buy into any other means for victory over sin. Let me ask a very blunt question. How do you deal with sin? Nobody wants to talk about sin. Everybody wants to think that everything that we do is okay. Everybody wants to think that everything is okay because God wants us to be happy. So we must do whatever makes us happy and God is pleased. That's the mindset of the world. And that's becoming the mindset of the church. Whatever we do goes. But everything does not go. We serve a holy God. And we must not offend or insult, or grieve, or quench, or resist the Holy Spirit. He is holy. And because he is holy, we must also be holy. Now, we do a terrible job at it because we are not perfect. We are still in this mortal body. And we still do things that are absolutely wrong. We say things wrong. We do things wrong. We are not perfect. Yet and still, Scripture says, Be ye perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. We ought to strive for perfection. 
When we sin, we go to the Father and he forgives us in Jesus' name. He forgives us. So we bless the Lord for that. But when we try and deal with sin apart from the cross, we insult the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you the different ways that people use, church folk use, in order to deal with sin in their life. And let me say this, most Christians, most Christians will not readily admit that they have sin in their lives. No, they won't say, Christians won't say that they're perfect, of course. We know that, they know that, I know that. But no one is willing to say, I have things in my life that are terrible. I have things in my life that trouble me. I have things in my life that are not good, that I don't want there. That's the case. If you're willing to admit those things, then how do you deal with sin in your life? Sometimes Christians, sometimes you will find that a Christian will be in bondage to something. To something. A mindset, a behavior. An action, an attitude. Christians can find themselves in bondage. How do you deal with sin in your life? Well, sometimes a Christian will say, I need to pray harder. I'm not going to want the one that's going to tell you there's anything wrong with praying. Because absolutely there's nothing wrong with praying. You need to pray. If you've sinned, you, Lord, cleanse me, forgive me, wash me, help me. So you got to pray harder. This is one of the things that people, that Christians do to alleviate the sinful condition. To gain victory over sin. Sinful behavior. They say, I got to pray harder. Or pray longer. Or pray more seriously. This is one of the things that Christians do. Secondly, they say, I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast my, I'm going to fast my sin away. I'm going to fast and, and every, when I'm done with the fast, I'll be better. Once again, I'm not the one that's going to tell you that there's anything wrong with fasting. Because absolutely there is nothing wrong with fasting. Scripture tells us this plainly. There's, there's nothing wrong with fasting. Sometimes the Lord will tell you to go on a fast. Sometimes he will. Sometimes the Christian will simply say, I need to just try harder. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to get up early in the morning. I'm going to read my... Nothing wrong with getting up early in the morning to have devotion. Between you and the Lord, before you leave the house, before you get started with your day. Nothing wrong with it. Absolutely not. Here's where the problem is. With all of those good things that folk do to try and alleviate the sinful condition. They put their faith in what they do. They put their faith, they create a law. When you put your faith in something, you are creating a law and you are saying, this thing is going to stop me from doing what I don't want to do. The more I read, the less I'm going to sin. I had a pastor tell me years ago, several years back, I had a pastor tell me, and he told me right to my face. Actually, I told him. I said, why are you doing so much? You're, you're running and you're, and you're going, you, you, you need to slow down. You're doing so much. And this particular pastor told me that the reason why they were doing so much, they, they admitted they were doing a lot, but there was a reason behind it. They said, the reason why I'm doing so much is to keep sin away. The more I do, the more sin, the less sin I will commit. And I said to myself, that's something wrong with that. That's not how you do it. That's not how you do it. By doing more, praying harder, doing things to another level, and all of a sudden sin is going to die down. What you're going to do, what you're actually going to do by 
doing more and creating law. I got to pray harder. I got to read more chapters. I got to fast for 21, 30, 40 days, whatever. When I do all these things, what you will do, you will agitate the sin nature, which is still in you. You agitate the sin nature and the sin nature will revive, as it says in Romans chapter 7, the sin nature will revive and you will find that your problem is not going away because you have invested all of your faith in the things that you are doing. Your faith cannot go into what you do. We do not have a works-based righteousness. Your faith must be, has to be, in Christ and the cross. It's there where the victory was already won. His victory is our victory. And so we no longer need, we no longer need to put our faith in the things that we do. We put our faith in what he has done. That's where our faith goes. And when we put our faith in what he has already done, this opens the door of grace and the Holy Spirit can work in our lives to help alleviate whatever it is that's going on in our life. But what's a process? It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't always happen automatically. But our faith has to be in the right place. So we insult the Holy Spirit when we think that there's another way to sanctification other than the cross. You see, you cannot move beyond the cross. And people in churches fall into mistake when they think that they already know about the cross. I already know everything about the cross. There's something more I have to do. No, there's no, no. You need you need to keep your focus. You need to keep your focus, your eyes on the cross. Your faith has to be in the cross. If you don't put your faith in the cross, it means that you are putting your faith someplace else. Someplace else. So you need to have your faith in the right place. In the right place. Listen, your faith will only be as strong as as the object it is placed in. Your faith will only be as strong as the object it is placed in. If you put your faith in the reading of the word, if you put your faith in the amount of time that you spend in prayer, if you put your faith in any of those things, you put your faith in the wrong place. You are putting it in yourself. And you don't have the power to alleviate. You don't have the power to move yourself out of the sinful condition. He has already done it. Faith has to be in the right place. We insult the Holy Spirit when we seek to minimize or diminish or dismiss the blood of Jesus. That is, the cross. In other words, when we don't give the cross its proper place in our life, we insult the Holy Spirit. Remember what we said in our first lesson several weeks back about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to glorify Jesus. The Holy Spirit is going to testify of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is going to speak of Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So the Holy Spirit is always going to promote who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is, all, is always going to promote what Jesus has done. That's what the Holy Spirit will always do. The Holy Spirit is not seeking the spotlight. Never. He's all about glorifying, testifying of, and lifting up Jesus. And that's what we ought to be about. We must not dismiss or diminish the work of the cross. 
the finished work of Jesus Christ. We fall into error when we try to add things on to the cross. You cannot add anything to the cross. He did it all at the cross. Every single blessing that you have, that I have, that we enjoy, every single blessing. You can go to Ephesians chapter 1 to, to begin to see some of the blessings that we share from the cross. The fact that we are justified, the fact that we are, the fact that we've been regenerated, the fact that we have been sanctified, all of these things and so much more. It's all because of the cross. If it were not for the cross, we would have nothing. Nothing. It's all because of the cross. And so we thank him. We thank him for what he did at the cross. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Where your faith was when you got saved is where your faith must remain. Your faith must not waver. Your faith must not go on to into something else. Your faith, the only reason you got saved is because you exercised faith in Christ and the cross. That's what you did. Go to, very quickly, go to uh, the book of Romans. The book of Romans, uh, chapter 10. Romans, chapter number 10, verses 9 and 10. This is what happened when you and I got saved. Romans, chapter 10, starting in verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, that's the Lord Jesus. Confess the Lord Jesus is talking about what he did. He's talking about who he was and what he did at the cross. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. That's all because of what happened at the cross. It says, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth Confession is made unto salvation. This is what happened when you and I got saved. There was a spiritual transaction. And at that point in time, you and I became a new creation. All things were passed away. All things became new. You became a brand new person. A brand new person. And you did not become a brand new person because you started going to church. You see, there's a difference between Christianity and churchianity. There's a grave difference. Christianity and churchianity. Churchianity is the belief that once I begin going to church and begin doing, quote, godly things, that it makes me godly and it makes me a Christian. And it does not. It does not. You are not born again. You are not saved. You are not a new creature until the Holy Spirit has convicted you of your sin and you have responded by seeking and asking the Lord Jesus Christ to save you and forgive you of your sins. Until you have a stark realization of your own sinfulness, you are not saved. You are not saved. I'm going to say that again. Until you have a stark realization. And I'm speaking about the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Until you have a stark realization of your own sinfulness made apparent to you by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, then you are not saved. The Holy Spirit brings you to a place of conviction where you want, you want change. You want what the Holy Spirit is offering. And the Holy Spirit is offering you Jesus. The Holy Spirit. I told you about that young lady. Earlier in the study, I told you about the young lady. When she heard about the claims of Jesus. That the wages of sin were death and the gift of God was eternal life. When she heard that she was a sinner. When she heard that she was on her way to hell. The Holy Spirit just took her right there. And she, was, she started crying and she was saved right there. 
She said, I want to be saved. That's what happens. Oh, it's not going to happen the same exact way to every single person. No, it's not going to happen like that. But you must come to the understanding, the realization that you are a sinner. Before I got saved, I will be the first one to tell you, I didn't know I was a sinner. I didn't care I was a sinner. I didn't believe I was a sinner. No chance. I was not a sinner. But after hearing the message of the cross, after hearing the word of life continuously, I was brought to the understanding by the Holy Spirit that I was a sinner. But I resisted. I resisted the Holy Spirit. I wanted no part of it because I still was trying to say that I was okay. I was still trying to tell myself that I was not a sinner, that I wasn't a bad person, that I needed no change, that I was all right. I was young. I'm okay. I got my whole life ahead of me. And you're trying to tell me that I'm a sinner and I need to give my heart to Jesus? Come on. But my life, began to show me that I needed Jesus more and more until I actually gave my heart to Jesus. You must come to the understanding and the realization that you are a sinner. That's when salvation can come. You see, what we have many times in many churches, many people, many people have simply become, simply have, uh, have become not converted but they have been awakened. They have had a spiritual awakening. They have been brought to the place of understanding and realizing, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I need help. But they're never brought into salvation because they stop there. They say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start going to church. I'm going to fix myself up. I'm going to start doing I'm going to do better. And they may get involved in church. And they may get involved in a ministry. And they, and they begin to outwardly show signs that they are born again. They come to church, they're involved in prayer meeting, they do all the things that everybody else does. But when did, when did the regeneration take place? When did the Spirit of God take up residence in their life? Until there is a conviction of sin, and the Holy Spirit comes into your heart, which changes you, then no, you're not saved. You could be in the choir and you're not saved. You can be an usher and you're not saved. You can be involved in any number of ministry that a church has. Uh, I heard a story about a woman uh, who was a Sunday school teacher for over 40 years. And she heard a message on television one particular Sunday. And she heard the gospel, and that gospel arrested her. It, it, it took her right on the spot, and she realized that she was not a Christian. And she was a Sunday school in a church for over 40 years. Well, yes, it can happen. There must be, you must have that spiritual transaction with Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. He changes your life. He changes your heart and you know your heart has changed. And other people know that something has changed in you. See, it's, it's more than just changing your address. It's more than just changing your clothes. And it's more, it's more. It's getting his spirit in you. We pick up church language. We pick up Christianese along the way also. And that helps to, that helps to buttress our position that we must be a Christian. Because we know how to say praise the Lord and hallelujah. We know how to wave our hands. And we know how to say yes brother and no brother and hi sister. And we know how to do these things. But it's still, all of those things do not equal salvation. Salvation is very specific. The Spirit of God enters in. He indwells us. We're going to be talking about that in weeks to come. The indwelling Holy Spirit, he comes in and he lives in us. And we now have what the Bible calls the divine nature. 
the divine nature. You have three natures. You have your human nature. You have a carnal nature that wants to sin. And you have, once you become saved, you have the divine nature. The indwelling Holy Spirit. And he changes everything. When the divine nature enters in, the sin nature is subdued. And the carnal nature also is subdued. Now these particular things can rise to the fore again when you give attention to law and if you don't order your steps properly sin will make a return sinfulness can make a return so we insult the Holy Spirit when we do these things finally we insult the Holy Spirit anytime we implement any system of rules, regulations, and regimens in place of simple faith in Christ. See, three things. Three things happen. Three things, three dynamics take place when we try and live our life according to law rather than by faith in Christ and what he has done. Three things happen. Number one, Galatians 2 and verse number 21. Let's go there. Galatians 2 and verse number 21. And it's a terrible thing, but it happens. Galatians 2 and 21 says that we frustrate the grace of God. We frustrate the grace of God. Here's what it says. Let me start at verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right there you see how you live the Christian life. It's not by works. It's not through law. It's not through doing and doing and doing. And not saying that you don't do those things. I need to make that perfectly clear. No one is saying don't pray and don't read and don't fast and don't. No, 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 no. No, those are the spiritual disciplines that you must employ in your Christian life. The problem is when we put our faith in those things to deliver us, to take us out of, to bring victory or sanctification into our lives, and it will not work. It will not work. We live this life by the faith of the Son of God or faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith in the Lord. Verse number 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And so when we, when we place, place our faith in something other than Christ and what he has done for us at the cross, when we place our faith in anything else, we frustrate the grace of God. We frustrate the grace of God because it says if righteousness can come by the law, if I could just be righteous just by keeping the law or doing this, 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 and this, this, and do it religiously and do it all the time. If I could, if, if, if I could be righteous by doing all those things, then why did Christ come? Christ came for nothing. Jesus, I don't need you. I, I could, all I need to do is just keep the law. Keep the commandments. That's it. That's it. That's it. I'm good. I'm good, Jesus. I, you don't want to do that. That's an insult to the Spirit of God. Second thing that happens, second thing that happens when we try and live by faith in something else, we, we fall from grace. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 4. It says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. 
if you think that justification can come by keeping the law, the doing of things, if you think that, he says, you are fallen from grace. It doesn't happen that way. You must put your faith in Christ and what he has done. You make Christ has become of no effect to you. Christ can do you no good if you are living under the law. You are either living under grace or under law. You cannot live under both. If you are living under law, then you are not living under grace, which comes through the cross. And if you are living under grace, which comes through the cross, you are not living by the law. It has to be one or the other. No one really understands that. If you're not living by grace, guess how you're living? By law. You're putting your faith and your hope, you're resting your laurels on the fact of all the things that you do. And all the things that you do keep you going. How do you know when you fasted enough? How do you know when you prayed enough? How do you know when you've read enough chapters? How do you know you don't? That's law. You never know. You never know. We are under grace. We are living in the dispensation of grace. But if you're not living by grace, you're not living by grace. <laughs> Finally, the third thing that can happen, that will happen, when we don't put our faith in Christ and what he has done. We read it already in Hebrews 10, 29. We insult the spirit of grace. And the spirit of grace is none other than the Holy Spirit. We do despite unto the spirit of grace. I want to read that verse one more time. One more time before we close out here tonight. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot trampled on, stomped on the Son of God. Who wants to do that? And hath counted the blood of the covenant, the blood that he shed on the cross, that brought us victory and brought us release from bondage. Wherewith he was sanctified. That blood sanctified us. It set us apart. Has counted that blood an unholy thing. And has done despite unto the spirit of grace. That is a loaded verse. You do not want to do this. I do not want to do this. I do not want to insult the Holy Spirit. I don't want to insult the Holy Spirit. By putting my faith in someplace else. By, by turning my back. On the merits of the cross. By ignoring. What he did on the cross. By thinking that I can. By thinking I can be delivered. By thinking that I can be sanctified. By thinking that I can have victory over sin. Just by keeping a set of laws. And rules and regulations and regiments. That's an insult. To the Holy Spirit that has sanctified you. Through the cross. That has already brought your victory. Brought your victory through the cross. That's an insult to believe. That you can have victory any other way. You know I listen to some. I listen to some pastors and teachers. And I listen to some of the things that they teach. That there's demons that can be hiding in you. On you. All sorts of things. Putting words together in such a way. That when people hear them they go wow. That sounds fantastic. I never knew that. I never understood that. You know why you never knew that? Because it's not true. It's not true. Now, I'm not going to take the time here tonight to mention names. Even though that's something that I do from time to time. I'm not going to mention names. But I read, I was listening to some somebody recently. And the things that he was saying, it was a travesty. It was an absolute travesty. It, it, I, I could not believe what he was saying. 
what was worse, there are people buying his books and listening to him and and somebody came to me and said, did I know of this person? That they listened to them and, and, and my mind almost exploded that they would even listen and be drawn in and taken in by the things that this individual was saying because it was ridiculousness. It just was not scriptural. It was false teaching, false doctrine, through and through. And I heard it and it just, it, it, arrows were sticking in me. Spiritual arrows were just coming. Bells were ringing. It was just, it was just crazy. It was whoop, 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 whoop. No, this is not good. What is this person talking about? But people hear him and they go, wow, what insight. That's great revelation from the Lord. No, it's not revelation from the Lord. No. God is not going to reveal to you something that's not in the Bible. He's not going to give you something brand, totally brand new. There's no new scripture being written. He did not give you this new insight because it's not in sight. It's not real. It's not real. And I hear people say some of these things. And I have to keep my ear to the and I have to keep my ear to the table because I need to know, as a teacher, I need to know what's going on. I need to know what people are teaching. I need to know because as a pastor, as a teacher, it is my job, my calling, to alert the body when something is up. Scripturally, doctrinally. I need to protect the people that God has put into, into my vision. I need to protect them, the people that God has put under me in the sense of hearing what I have to say. I'm not anybody's boss or king or anything like that. But those who do hear what I say, I have an, I have an obligation to speak the truth. And when I hear some of the things that I hear, because I have to keep my ear to the grindstone, as they say, because I need to know what's going on. It, it 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 makes my ears tingle. It, it it does something. And sometimes I'd make a I make a mental note. Sometimes I write down what I hear because I need to let people know this is what is being said. This is what they said, but here's what the Bible says. So you have to be careful. You have to be very mindful and very careful that you hear the word of God. And do not stray away from the word of God. Do not stray away. Do not stray away. You have to be very, very, very careful. So once again, as we close, when we put our faith, when we put our faith any place else but in the cross, we insult the Holy Spirit. And three things happen. We frustrate the grace of God. We fall from grace, and as we have been stating, we insult the spirit of grace, which is the Holy Spirit. Faith has to be in Christ and the cross, not in anything else. We cannot do all of these little extra things and think that we are pleasing God. If it's not in scripture, then it should not be done. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Now when we come back, when we come next week, there's several, two other things. When we come back next week, two other things. And we're talking, we've been talking about the, uh, the personality, the personality of the Holy Spirit. As I said, we already talked about the resisting, that we ought not resist him. We talked about the fact that we should not quench him. Uh, we should not grieve him. And tonight we spent the time talking about the fact that we should not insult him and how we go about insulting him. We don't want to do this. Next week, there's a couple more, couple of more things that we need to talk about. When we talk about the personality of the Holy Spirit, we'll get into those too when we come together next time. Amen. Lord, I pray that you might touch, Lord, 
those who have been under the sound of your word tonight, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you might help this word, Lord Jesus, to settle in their hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray you might teach them your way, Lord Jesus. Father, have your way. Bless us together right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We want to bless the Lord. We want to thank him for giving us once again this opportunity uh, to speak the word of God. We, we relish, we look forward to these Wednesday nights where we have a chance to uh, study the word of God. And I pray that you are alerting and letting someone else know that the Wednesday night Cutting It Right Bible study is here as a service to the body of Christ. We want to learn his word. We want to hear his word. We want to allow the word of God to settle in. We thank you for listening. We see you. We, we thank you, Stephanie. We, 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 we see you there. Uh, we see you, uh, Darlene. We thank you for your we thank you for supporting us. We thank you for being there. Um, and once again, let someone us know. Share this page. Uh, go over to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, check out our website at that's the word .org. Do all those good things, and I I know you'll be you'll be blessed. Amen. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. This is me. <laughs> that's you. We thank you for listening. We thank you for watching. Once again, shout out to all of those on Spreaker.com who do listen in from across the United States and, yes, around the world. We thank you for your support. We thank you for listening. We thank you for downloading our podcast. This is me. That's you. Have a good night. We'll see you next week right back here on the Wednesday Night Cutting It Right Bible Study. May God bless you. <laughs>